family farm near Canturk after Tyg's wife raised the alarm. In the UK, the Old Bailey has heard a 999 call made by Armagh lorry driver Morris Robinson, who discovered the bodies of 39 people in a trailer he was transporting. The Vietnamese migrants, who'd travelled from Belgium to Perfleet in Essex, suffocated inside the container in October last year. Four other men, two of whom were also from Northern Ireland, are on trial in connection with the deaths and alleged people smuggling operation. A sixth man, Ronan Hughes from County Monaghan, has admitted manslaughter. Morris Robinson, who also pleaded guilty to manslaughter. Here it tells the call handler what he saw. I heard the noise in the back and I opened the door and there's a bunch of them land. How many approximately? The trailer's jammed. Uh, I don't know. Tell me approximately how many patients? 25. 25 patients not breathing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's your news update. We'll have more in an hour. News Talk Weather. Thanks to the AA. For our most competitive van insurance, go to the AA.ie. Tonight will be blustery with scattered showers, some of them heavy with a risk of hail and thunderstorms. Showers heaviest and most frequent across the west, with parts of the east and southeast staying mostly dry. Lows of between 5 and 8 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Football Show on Off the Ball with Paddy Power. Fake crowd noise. The Emirates never sounded so good. Gamble responsibly. See I'm prepared to end it in my well, do, it then. do it then. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. Now then, you're welcome along. It's a busy football show for you this evening. Amber Barrett was part of a disappointing night in Kiev on Friday. She's going to join us from her home club in Cologne towards the end of the football show this evening. Latest in the Champions Leagues, half times, uh, second half's just getting underway, but half time still. Liverpool nil, FC Michelin of Denmark nil at Anfield. Man City 1 0 up away to Marseille. Real Madrid 1 0 down to Borussia Mönchengladbach and Atletico have equalised against Salzburg uh, this evening. Earlier on, Bayern Munich 2 1 winners away to Moscow and Inter drew 0 0 with Shakhtar Donetsk. Porto are 1 0 up on Olympiakos. That is where we are. I'll keep you up to date on that League of Ireland Division 1 situation as well across the next 45 minutes or so. Happy to say John Bruin is with us in the meantime. Evening, John. Good evening, Joe. How are you? Very well. I do want to talk to you about Marcus Rashford and the amazing week he has had, but uh, some breaking news from Barcelona. I'm sure you may have seen this as well. So the uh, Barcelona president, Josep Maria Bartomeu, and the entire board have resigned, which may not come as a huge surprise to anybody. You take on Messi, generally, I would suspect, at Barcelona. If you don't win that fight, it's going to end one way. So he's opted to leave rather than ask club members to vote on his future. I'll bet he has. That, <laughs> that's not a losing margin he wants to see. Uh, in, in raw figures. So over 20,000 supporters signed a petition this month asking for him to be removed. PK had described the amount of money the board has spent on players as an atrocity. In April, six board members resigned at the running of the club. We know all about the Messi situation. No surprise, really. Uh, well, none whatsoever. It's been coming a while. Um, he certainly wasn't. didn't seem like he was going to last until the next election, and he was going to lose that election. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, once Messi stayed, and that was a fairly, well, messy situation, wasn't it? Um, Bartomeu was on his way out. Now, the interesting thing there, just reading about it, is that his payoff appeared to be that he said that he'd agreed that Barcelona would join a European Super League and then just left it there. So um, back we go to the uh, Super League narrative. Let's see what comes of that. I mean... I suppose there's a big difference between signing a deal and actually getting it done with, as regards La Liga and all the rest of it. But um, ructions at that club, you've got to say that uh, there's a club that have frittered away. Um, I mean, it feels feel strange to say this, but they've frittered away the career of the best player of all time. It, it always feels to me, OK, Barcelona have been serial champions in, in uh, La Liga, but uh, they should have won more European Cups with with Lionel Messi and the team, and that's not happened. Mm. Um, and that's a, a lot of that's to do with the transfer policy of that club. Uh, there are several white elephants floating around uh, Catalonia. Antoine Griezmann would be one. Uh, Dembele would be another. Um, 
You've also got Philip Coutinho who's back at the club this season. I mean, so those those players each costing around 100 million euros, all of them misfits. Um, and ultimately, the team which did win the European Cup, uh, the Champions League, back in 2015, and, and before that, uh, the players, uh, the best players in Barcelona's team are still those players from that era, PK, Busquets, and Messi, of course. So, um, a shambles, he had to go. Seems like he's been there for too long to me. Yeah, it's a lesson in how to spend or how not to spend a billion euro over the no. last five years. I only hope the European Super League, by the way, will be more exciting than all this talk about the European Super League. Oh, yeah. I mean, the thing is about this, it, it, it seems to flow. I mean, listen, it's about money. We know that. Um, it's been floating since the, I think, the 98-99 season. There was this company called Media Partners, which forced UEFA's hand and forced them to make the Champions League into a bigger competition. We've had various iterations of it floated, um, and the latest one appeared to be affiliated to FIFA with Manchester United and Liverpool, as always, uh, towards the front of that, though. The, 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 the signs out of Manchester United in particular were that they didn't want to be associated with this just at this point. Um, and I suppose the one thing is that Bartomeu... Uh, has done a fairly rare thing, which is to come out and say that their club are for it. Because um, I'll I tell you one thing, um, I suppose if you're unpopular with fans and you're on your way out, then joining a Super League is probably about the most unpopular thing you could probably do. Mm. Uh, because the fans of clubs, the fans that actually go to matches, uh, I would say are 95% against the Super League. Marcus Rashford. Yes. It's quite extraordinary, really. So there's a kind of a, a controversy, you know, around him today. Yeah. Uh, to what extent, I don't know. So it seems Marcus Rashford, who is the, by a distance in all the polls and with the bookies, the favourite to win BBC Sports Personality of the Year, it seems he won't be on the shortlist. He won't be on it. Yeah. Well, listen, Joe, uh, I, I'm going to say this. Sports Personality of the Year is the biggest waste of time... <laughs> perhaps in British TV, and I don't know how much British TV you watch, but there's a lot of waste of time involved. I mean, it was good in the old days when David Coleman and Steve Ryder presented it and you're able to catch up on the year uh, just gone, but these days it's it, 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 it's a sham of an event. And uh, listen, we all know the sports person of the year, if, if such a thing matters, mm. is Marcus Rashford because that word personality. Now, he's a 22-year-old guy from Manchester. He's from very humble beginnings, which is at the root of what he's pushing for. And he has made a huge impression on, well, essentially, the, the well-being of the nation and continues to do so, and can he's, continues to do so in an adult fashion beyond the politicians in this country. Um, and so, you know, you, who else could there be? OK, Lewis Hamilton is... Someone that I've seen mentioned because he is a, you know, he, he's beaten Michael Schumacher's record. He's probably going to win his seventh F1 title. But, you know, Lewis Hamilton will probably win another world title mm. and can win it another year. Marcus Rashford is the man, not just sport, the man of 2020, which has been a desperate year. And he's been a shining light for, for this country. Yeah, he sure has. I mean, I doubt he gives... Uh, you know what about the BBC Sports Absolutely. Personality of the Year Award. I woke up today to Piers Morgan and Gary Lineker bickering about it on Twitter, which, by the way, is not a great way to start your day, and, and that's on me. No, but no, that's, no. That's, that's, that's why it's in my head. So, Rashford, I mean, I remember a couple of months ago, this all came to the fore initially because, it, effectively, he forced a complete U-turn on the government's part within the space of 24 hours on this issue, the issue of feeding school yeah. children who need it. And that, that just doesn't happen, you know, that kind of a U-turn. And so a couple of months on, it seems that he has turned his attention to the fact that over the upcoming midterm, those yeah. same children won't be fed. Uh, there was no about turn on the government's part this time around. It seems to have been quite toxic. So am I right in saying basically over the, pa over the, the, the course of the past week, in the midst of scoring that brilliant goal in Paris and uh, the Chelsea game, he effectively harnessed the goodwill of uh, companies and businesses all around the UK who were volunteering to feed uh, children who might need the food over midterms. You know, everything from small restaurants saying children eat free here to other businesses who are donating plans. His yeah. Twitter feed was the epicentre of that movement. Is that basically what's happened? Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
on the, I think that was the Friday, wasn't it? When yeah. Actually, it's just pumping out um, business after business, and let's face it, local businesses have been under the pump, haven't they? In, in, in uh, well, especially in this time, uh, and um, just doing the work that uh, the government have refused to do. Um, I don't know if you remember the Big Society, Joe. Uh, that was David Cameron's big idea ten years ago for this country, uh, which was uh, to replace the uh, welfare state and uh, the, the um, central state looking after people, that society uh, would look after each other and that you know, would, that, that, that local companies would look after local people. It's actually some sort of weird Victorian idea of charity that he was trying to dredge up. But um, in the absence of uh, the Conservative Party, Boris Johnson's government, meeting... Uh, Marcus Rashford's request to feed starving children at a time of deep recession. Uh, those companies have stepped in and Marcus Rashford has done uh, a great job and he's done it, as I say, as an adult. You've had various um, politicians who presumably messages from Conservative uh, Central HQ have been af asking for uh, to sort of pick at the, the idea of uh, kids being given free meals You've had various um, accounts, uh, let's say, of a right-wing hue talking about how you can knock up a, a meal for 30p with uh, an egg and uh, make an omelette with tomatoes and, uh, you know, some shin beef shin or whatever. I mean, it, it, <laughs> Twitter, as you said, Joe, uh, it's probably not a place to go uh, if you're not feeling good about yourself. Uh, Marcus Rashford briefly made it that way. Unfortunately, the way things are, uh, something of a culture war has sprung out about this, sprung up about this this affair. Um, but meanwhile, Marcus Rashford himself um, and the people behind him. Let's let, let, let's let's state this that uh, th there is some cynicism about Marcus Rashford in the fact that it, it is said he is uh, that he can't be doing this himself. Um, and, and and it's it's clear and it's obvious. And those in the know will tell you that the. the he is working with people that, um, that know what they're doing. But uh, from another point of view, uh, speaking to someone who does know quite a bit about this, is that Rashford himself is driving this project on. He is at the centre of it. It's something that he's really passionate about, that he gives his spare time to. Um, and, you know, if it, it, let's put it this way. An opposition party campaigning for this is going to get nowhere with the Conservative Party or the, the government, whoever that might be. Um, but he has managed to raise himself above politics in this country, um, including to the point where um, various Tory MPs were receiving uh, abusive messages and he asked people to calm down. Um, mm. And as I said, he's the adult in the room, uh, an outstanding young man. Uh, it makes me feel an old man to call him a young man, but that's exactly what he is. And, and as I say, forget the sporting personality of the year, he is the personality of the year. Yes. I did see him actually going on Twitter to ask people not to abuse those Tory MPs and their families. He said, believe me, as a Premier League player, I know too all, all too well what it feels like and it's unnecessary. And he called for collaboration and togetherness. So he has certainly managed to stay above the politics here. I saw Sean Ingle was writing about it. And he was making the point, similar to what we've just talked about, that Rashford has been able to carry people on all sides with him. So he says it was noticeable when he thanked Leeds United players for donating 25,000 to the school meals campaign. Many Leeds fans responded by returning the compliment. Whisper it, but he might be the first United player in living memory to be applauded at Ellen Road if fans are back anytime soon. And I suspect he would be applauded at every single ground he might play at. Because, I mean, you wouldn't yeah. think there'd be any division over the issue of let's feed children who can't. Um, I was going to say feed themselves or be, be fed by their um, their family. You wouldn't, you know, you just wouldn't think that's the divisive issue here. That politics will be uh, split down at the moment. So, can you explain to me, uh, not that poverty uh, isn't a part of every country, and you know we have families here who cannot feed themselves, and we have organisations like Saint Vincent de Paul, for instance. The the, the concept of a of a food bank is yes. that is that a decades old thing. In England, is that a relatively new thing? Like you talk about David Cameron and big society as opposed to the welfare state. Or, like have food banks been around forever? What, what, that, that culture I'm not as familiar with, John. I mean, I, I could call myself a historian of the food bank, but certainly the idea of the food bank in the last 10 years has become 
extremely prevalent. Um, and l l let's let's say that uh, a few clubs and a few fans of clubs have been collecting for food banks over that time. I mean, Chelsea, a club that you would probably associate with a, a pr particularly well-heeled um, group of fans, have certainly had a food bank running for quite a few years. Um, yeah, it's this idea that um, you uh, <laughs> that society comes in and helps because of the shortfall and because we, uh, well, a, a bit like you, have had this austerity politics and uh, families f feeding large families or feeding uh, even a small family is very difficult uh, on, on the uh, benefits that you would receive from the government if you're unemployed or you are low paid. And so, yeah, um, there's been a big change in this country uh, and that came after 2010. Ostensibly, it was to pay for the, uh, the, the money that was supposedly lost, well, the money that was lost during the uh, economic crash of 2008 and the recession that followed that. But it was an ideological thing, as I said, by the, the Conservative Party at that time that felt that um, society should help out the uh, the poorest and that, 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 that uh, people on benefits were people who, uh, you know, would be better served by being forced out to work on, on labour. And, and it's, I'm sure, all, all concepts I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, but yes, this idea of food banks has been around but uh, Marcus Rashford's push for this uh, has certainly moved above and beyond that. Now, I mean, actually, today has been the story that Meza Ozil, who uh, I was talking to about talking to you about last week, mm. uh, he's donating uh, uh, mon uh, money and uh, uh, to uh, local kids. He lives lives up in Barnet, um, North London, uh, to local kids. And I think uh, one of the good things is that uh, Marcus Rashford is probably going to be a trendsetter in football. Now, if you recall, at the at the start of the pandemic or the pandemic's forcing of a lockdown on this country, uh, Conservative MPs, particularly uh, Matt, ha Matt Hancock, the, uh, well, let's call him the beleaguered health secretary of this country, um, was calling on uh, Premier League footballers to take a wage cut and, uh, you know, put money back in. Well, Marcus Rashford has led the way there. Uh, and um, at the end of it, um, Premier League footballers have stepped up uh, with, with Rashford at the front of that. Um, and at, at the time, that felt like an attack on, essentially, footballers are people from working class backgrounds like Marcus Rashford. And it felt like an attack on that type of person by the Conservative Party, rather than attacking, let's say, uh, people that work in banks or senior managers at banks. Um, I think <laughs> I think the thing you could state from this is that uh, class uh, and poverty are um, issues that certainly in my time <laughs> as a, uh, a, a well as an adult have never been quite so prevalent as they are now. And uh, again, we come back to that figure of uh, Marcus Rashford, a, a lightning rod for it, almost like a uh, you know a, an innocence at, at the heart of it. Um, and someone that's driven on the debate. And what will come at a certain point is a Conservative Party U-turn, uh, because they're probably going to have to, to come to mm. a decision on this. That, that, um, that, that, and, uh, but then again, we are used to U-turns in this country as well. Yeah. On the uh, football pitch then over the last couple of days, we had a bank holiday here yesterday, so we didn't quite dig into the Ooh. weekend that was. It was an OK-ish weekend. I mean... Anyone who watched the Man United Chelsea game won't get that 90 minutes back again. They did get Patrice Ever and Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank having a hilariously entertaining conversation. High points being Ever pointing to the stitches on his uh, shin and telling Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank that he hadn't forgotten that Jimmy had done that. But did we win that game and did I play on? Yes. And then going back to the conversation they were having. Uh, the gist of which seemed to be Ever uh, not impressed at all, particularly United at home, uh, playing with such caution and fear and even Chelsea too, and Jimmy Floyd uh, playing the part of more understanding uh, parent and saying he could understand why both teams were playing it cautiously. Yes, well, uh, um, Sky seems to have hit on a, 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 a duo there, don't they? With, <laughs> I, I could see that one being brought back again. It was absolutely fantastic entertainment. As you say, the game itself, utterly forgettable, apart from uh, Harry Maguire's wrestling on Aspilicueta, 
um, and a, a match. That, I mean, what, what you had there is two teams that um, uh, my uh, well, you you know the guy you know Rafa Honigstein our our friend mm-hmm. calls that thing a broken team mm-hmm. in which the bits of the team don't fit together mm-hmm. and that's what Chelsea have got um, in the fact that Frank Lampard has decided to work on his defence. And he got it right. Thiago Silva actually had a very, very good game. Uh, and But that meant that his his strikers, Timo Werner, Kai Havertz, are neglected almost. And they, both of them, you know, disappeared from that match. And Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's position is, and, and, and problem is, is much the same. Uh, it was relying on actually Marcus Rashford again uh, to pull off some kind of miracle, which he didn't quite manage to do. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that uh, Chelsea actually have a goalkeeper now, uh, Ed- Edouard Mendy, who made two, let's call them regulation saves, mm. because uh, you'd expect a goalkeeper to make them. But uh, when Kepa's been around, that has not been a guarantee by any means. John, one of the interesting talking points now around Manchester United is can Pogba and Fernandez play in the same team? And initially, when Fernandez had joined, uh, the opposite seemed to be the case. We, we were talking about how Pogba had found someone and these two were going to you know, really strike up a partnership. So, for instance, Monday Night Football last night, Gary Neville was arguing Pogba and Fernandes could play in the same team if Solskjaer played them like De Bruyne and Silva at Man City. Here was Carragher's response to that. The players you're talking about, they, they haven't got that discipline. They, they haven't got I don't. I think if Matic or Fred's in that position, he looks up, Fernandez could be on the wing, Pogba could be in the centre-forward position. This is not me just saying it on the back of since Fernandez has come in. The first time I analysed Paul Pogba, four years ago I think it was, it was in a Manchester derby and he was playing centre midfield. And we'd done it on the show. He was standing on the left wing for goal kicks. It was just... Yeah, I, and then I said on that show, I can't understand how a, a world-class talent or someone who's been bought for that much money you think is going to come in doesn't understand where he needs to be off a goal kick. I mean, you've just said Pogba's a great player. I'd actually say he's a great talent. Unbelievable talent. I don't think there's possibly anything he can't do in some ways. But a great talent, for me, doesn't always make a great player. I don't think his understanding of the game is amazing. And that, for me, defines... Someone a great player, and, and that's why I'd always say Pogba's a great talent rather than a great player. Is there anywhere else on the pitch you could get him in then, rather than in the midfield? Could you play him in one of the attacking positions? No, I think he, well, he has played. They played wide left, and if if you uh, wanted to get it, him and Fernandez in the same side, wide, in, in a four for Juventus, he played on the left um, and did that regularly for a number of years and was successful with it. I, I, I find it really difficult to understand how a player who's played at Juventus in a brilliant team, who's won many titles, then goes on to play in a brilliant French team in a World Cup and wins a World Cup, and he's a star in that team, can't be regarded as a great player. I don't think Manchester United have been a great team in this last few years. I don't think Paul Pogba has played brilliantly for Manchester United, but the idea that he can't be a great player because you know he, he, he lacks a little bit of discipline. But, well, sorry, sorry, De, De, Daddy, De Bruyne and Silva. Daddy, after four years, without, still debating what his position is. But, to be honest, if you said to me De Bruyne would turn into what he's turned into under Pep Guardiola, I said no chance. There's no way he can be as good defensively as he is in an attacking sense, which is what he's done. His transition from attack to defence is unbelievable now under Pep Guardiola. It never was before he got there. He was more of a sort of, he was a massive luxury player in the sense that he was a brilliant player, De Bruyne, before Pep Guardiola got to um, Manchester City, but on the ball, not off the ball. He was coached, he was moved into a position that then made, he made his own. So I, I don't sort of give up hope that Matic, Pogba, Fernandes can't play together in that three. There's going to come a point whereby the burden of having Paul Pogba on your shoulder is going to sort of shine brightly on Oli and he's going to have to get him into the team at some point alongside Fernandes, like he did post-lockdown, whereby they did well together, they, they, they had some good results. I think it can happen again. I don't, I don't share your pessimism um, about how, him. How, how, after four years at Manchester United, are, you, are we still talking about finding his best position and can Oli get more out of him? Can he add this discipline to his game? He's been there four years. John Bruin, are you, <laughs> are you Jamie Carragher? Or are you Gary Neville? I, I am more of Jamie Carragher, definitely. Um, it's interesting, actually, that uh, Jamie Carragher sort of talks there about a player uh, who's a great player. He, he can't be a great player without knowing his best position. Now, who's the footballer that you most associate 
Jamie Carragher with, the player that he was closest to, that was Steven Gerrard. Um, now, Steven Gerrard, before Liverpool fans get excited, was a brilliant player. And uh, it has to be said, a much better player than Paul Pogba has been so far, or particularly uh, in the Premier League. Um, uh, he hasn't won a World Cup. Uh, but uh, it, it's that idea that you play it, you can never... It's that idea of discipline, mm. isn't it? And um, Which he showed in the World Cup for France, ironically. He did, he did. And obviously Didier Deschamps managed to, to work on that. But, um, OK, under the managers that... Clearly, his relationship with Jose Mourinho was not great after that first season together. Um, I do wonder how much, let's not call it respect, but um, how much he listens to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer or how much Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is able to convey to a player like Paul, uh, to, to Paul Pogba. I've nearly called him Paul Scholes, if only. Eh? Um, and um, you... Uh, but you know, but, but I am reminded of the the, the relationship that say uh, Gerard had with uh, Rafa Benitez, uh, in which they never really seemed to hit it off, did they? But uh, although Gerard played some fantastic football for him, but he would be, be put all over the team, mm. and eventually he was put off Fernando Torres because Benitez didn't want him uh, to to get embedded in midfield because he thought his lack of discipline would cause problems there. Mm. Gerard was a good enough player to carry that off. Is Paul Pogba a good enough player to move forward? Well, actually, you'd say that Manchester United have got some pretty good forwards and there isn't really a place for him there. The man in possession of the creative role is Bruno Fernandes. He's the guy that's putting put performances together. He's scoring goals, OK, mostly from the penalty spot. But he's also, at the same time, showing leadership as well. It's noticeable that he's getting to wear the captain's armband. Um the Pogba thing, um, it hasn't worked out. I'm of Carragher's opinion that after four or five years, we should have seen quite a lot more from him. Um, and they're going to have to find somewhere for him to go at some point. And I really don't know who that's going to be. Mm. Uh, that's something that's going to have to shake out. Uh, I think his contract's till 2022. Let's see what happens. John Bruin, as ever, pleasure. Thanks a million. Cheers, Joe. Good to talk. See ya. Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power New normal, same old football Paddy Power Gamble responsibly, gamblingcare.ie Ooh, Shane, what have you got there? That looks like a good lunch It's delicious Liver with some fava beans And a nice Chianti uh, Lovely this Friday on Newstalk, we're getting dressed up to raise money for Trick or Treat for Temple Street. I hope that new mask makes sense. And we want you to join in too. We're asking you to dress up in your favourite Halloween costume. And whether it's something funny or scary, there's just one rule. If you dress up, you donate. It's a great way to have some fun while raising vital funds for life-saving treatment for Temple Street Hospital's little patients. Join us by dressing up this Friday and find out how to donate at newstalk.com slash donate. Strange times, we say. They certainly are. But we take heart from the spirit people are showing. Looking out for neighbours, thinking about what really matters. And right now, around the country, good people are working to produce great tasting Irish food brands. Local products you can really trust. So when you shop, you can support thousands of Irish jobs and businesses by looking for the Love Irish Food heart. So next time you're shopping, have a heart. Love Irish Food. This Friday. Show me the one safety deemed such destruction. The phenomenon returns to Disney+. Plus. You must reunite it with its own kind. Stream the new season of The Mandalorian. Where? This you must determine. The award-winning saga continues. You know this is no place for a child. Wherever I go, he goes. So I've heard. The Mandalorian. New season streaming this Friday only on Disney+. Plus. 18 plus subscription required. T's and C's apply. The Kilkenny sale is now on. There's up to 50% off. Almost everything's reduced. Shop online at kilkennyshop.com or by phone. Free click and collect now available nationwide. Kilkenny, where Christmas means more. In the coming weeks, Healthy Ireland will be sending letters to thousands of people asking them to take part in our annual survey. This survey is done over the phone. 
It's a quick check-in that lets us assess the mental and physical well-being of the whole country. If you get a letter, make the call and help keep Ireland on track for a healthier future. From Healthy Ireland, an initiative of the Government of Ireland. Visit gov.ie forward slash Healthy Ireland for more. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. Minimal contact in stadiums? Shouldn't stop the usual suspects from going down. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie Now you're welcome back. I'm sure lots of you were watching on Friday night. It was ultimately a very disappointing evening for the Irish football team in Kiev. They lost 1-0 to Ukraine. And with regard to European qualification, left Ireland behind the eighth ball. Ireland have one game left, that's against Germany on December 1st. Ukraine have Greece and Montenegro. They played Greece this evening, they won 4-0. And Montenegro have lost all seven games. So we can presume that Ireland are going to have to pull off something extraordinary and special against Germany on December 1st. Amber Barrett joins us. Amber, how are you doing? Hi lads, good to see you. No, thanks for joining us. I presume you're back in Cologne at this stage, are you? Yeah, we got back on Saturday evening. So the news this evening, not entirely unexpected. You were looking for Greece to do you a favour against Ukraine. Isn't as we would have wanted. Ukraine have won 4-0. Uh, the disappointment of Friday, I suspect, is still with you in a big day, in a big way, rather. Yeah, I suppose there was um, a few Hail Mary said this morning, hoping <laughs> that Greece could have done us a, could have done us a wee favour today. But, um, you know, just even this morning, still getting out of bed, you still have that just feeling in the pit of your stomach that just really, really disappointing. And... Unfortunately, we look at Friday and it was a huge opportunity missed. Um, I think considering we only needed a point going into the game to get into the playoffs. And just now we leave ourselves in a position where, as you said, um, you know, there's a good chance that Ukraine will beat Montenegro on the final day. So we need to we need to get a result against Germany. And um, as the man says, stranger things have happened. But um, of course, very disappointing after Friday's result. Yeah, I can well imagine. And be, not least because of the buzz that's around the team at the moment and the games have been in TV and so much good work has been done in this campaign. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I suppose when you're being a little bit critical now and reflecting on it a little bit, the game away to Greece where we, you know, we conceded in the 92nd minute mm. is a game that we really, really shouldn't have dropped any points there. And, you know, even watching the first half of Greece and Ukraine today, um, I'm still, you know, still kind of baffled that we did manage to drop points against them. But unfortunately for us, that was something that happened. And, you know, the results after that were quite good. We went away then to, um, we beat Greece at home, beat Montenegro away. Um, of course, the re most recent camp, Germany, was, of course, a very difficult game for us. But then, you know, coming into the Ukraine game, we're still in a very good position. And like you said, things have, have went for us in this in this campaign very well, and you know we're kind of sitting on our sitting looking and I suppose nearly baffled at the stage that we're in the mm. position we are. But um, you know there's still a game left for us, and there's still a huge opportunity for us to do very well. You were on the bench on Friday, Amber. What did you make of the game as it transpired? To be honest with you, you know after the goal went in, and I suppose Katie missing the penalty. Um, if I'm being really honest, there was a little bit of I suppose doubt kind of crept into my own head. Um, I was still very confident of the girls playing and, you know, the, the players that we have, that we can always get something out of it. But I just felt that even in the first half and early in the second half, there was a couple of balls that just didn't drop for us in the right way. Or, you know, Rihanna's effort in the first half it just trickled towards the line where another game, that's one of those just rolls into the back of the net. And... It was very difficult for the girls. You could see the effort. Everybody run themselves into the ground, and it was just, you know, we could. I, I'm absolutely convinced if we play Ukraine another nine times between now and, you know, over the next couple of weeks, we, we'd beat them every single time. So it's just one of those games that just, it just didn't fall for us. And unfortunately for us, they managed to score the goal, or we managed to score the goal for them, which I think even made it, you know, a little bit worse as well. Yes, Ireland dominated the ball for huge spells. You mentioned Katie McKay's penalty. And then, I mean, the goal is just so awful. That does give you, a, a, I suspect, a thought in your head, Jesus, this going to be, is, maybe this isn't our night. You know, like it, it did take on that quality as the game transpired, but you just felt, geez, Ireland can't dominate this much and not get some chance towards the end. And I don't know, like, why? 
what can you say afterwards? What could you do differently, really? It's not like you can turn around to Anya O'Gorman or Courtney Brosnan or Katie McCabe and, you know, say something as obvious as don't do that the next time. Exactly. And, you know, again, if, if Katie hits that penalty again, I know, I have no doubt about it, she'd put it in the back of the net. And it, as you said, like when I say that, you know, I had a little bit of doubt, it wasn't, you know, again, doubting the players. It was just doubting us and, oh God, is it going to be one yeah. of those games that we get stuck into now? And that is exactly what it um, transpired out to be. And unfortunately for us, we just ended up on the wrong side of it, you know, and if you had a said to us before the game, you'll score an own goal, you'll miss a penalty, you know, we would have laughed at mm. that because it just wouldn't have happened. But I suppose now the most important thing is for the likes of Courtney and Anya and of course Katie as well, and they already know this, but it's how now they react to that disappointment as well, personally, because, you know, I think out of the th out of everybody, the three of them really took it very, very hard on Friday. And, you know, these things happen, you know, there's, there's other players on the pitch that have... Uh, you know, they needed to take the responsibility as well. But unfortunately for the girls, it was those little mistakes that did cost us in the end. I would imagine they were inconsolable in the dressing room. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like yourself, what what do you say to them? Mm. Oh, better luck next time or, oh, you know, you, you'll be back. And, like, these things are great. But at that moment in time, that's not what the players wanted to hear. Um, to see how close it was and, you know, if, we, if Katie misses the penalty but we score and it goes to one all, like, you know, all the little mistakes are forgotten about. It's just that, unfortunately for us, um, they were the they were the mistakes that did cost us the game in the end. You mentioned Greece away. From remember, you scored a brilliant goal that day. You were on the bench until the 86 minute Friday. You've been in very good form for Cologne. Lots of people felt you should have got on earlier. Four minutes plus out of time isn't very much time to make an impact. So I've no doubt you have your own frustrations from the night as well. Yeah, but you know, at the same time, it's. When Vera picks the team and, you know, you have Rihanna Jarrett, who's an excellent striker, goes out and starts it, you know, I have full confidence in her that she's going to she's going to be, if she gets the ball in the right areas, that she's going to cause cause the opposition problems. And she's always she's always there or thereabouts for goals. So, of course, me personally, you know, you know, if I was picking the team, I'd be playing every week. But that's, that's just not the way it works. And, you know, I think now the next four weeks is really important for everybody that, you know, they have they have good good games, good trainers with their clubs, but the attitude is right. The players are motivated and ready to go into the game in four weeks against Germany and absolutely throw the kitchen sink at them because at this stage you now we do we do not have anything to lose. And um, for me, that will certainly be the case with Cologne. You know, as you said, I've been in good form and I'd like to carry that on as well. This Germany team are awesome, aren't they? They are, but beatable. Thus far, they haven't looked all that beatable. What did, what did you learn about them in so much as you can share with us? What did you learn from that 3-0 defeat earlier on in the campaign? I suppose, I think one thing that we did, um, I suppose at halftime, the, the players were very kind of um, felt aggrieved about was I suppose the amount of um, space they were getting on in the centre of the field. And, you know, when you have the likes of Marazan and, and who's... You know they're absolutely fantastic players, but I suppose at times we were giving them too much space. Um, these players are excellent in two, three meters of space, never mind five or ten meters of space, which we ended up giving them at mm -hmm. times. And I think in the second half, you know, it really showed that when we actually stepped a little bit higher, we got a little bit close to them. I think yes, they had maybe one or two big chances in the second half, but we completely, I think, shut out their threats, and mm -hmm. it was more of kind of putting the ball into the box, and then. You know, you have when you have Louise Quinn in there and Dan uh, Caldwell and Nifa, you're always very confident that they'll be able to stay with the danger. So um, it's going to be very interesting over the next few weeks with Germany because obviously now they've qualified. There's going to be question marks. You know, will they bring? You know, will they bring the full the full squad? You know, the strong squad, and even like this idea that they might bring second string squad. Their second string squad would probably start most international games for other countries as well. So. Um, it's going to be difficult, there's absolutely no doubt about it, but I'm very, in a quiet way, quietly confident that anything can happen in football, and I think Friday night shows that. You mentioned some of their brilliant players. I have to say, every time I watch Ireland, Denise O'Sullivan just jumps out as well. She is incredible. Absolutely, and when you have somebody like that in your team, you're always you're always very confident that you're, you are going to get, you're going to get chances, and... Do you know, for me, it's it's not even Denise's how she her work rate is something that stands out, of course. But yeah. it's how she gets herself out of small areas, surrounded by players, by just dropping the shoulder and going, or just 
you know, rolling the ball through somebody's legs and getting it on the other side. And, you know, I think when you look at Friday, you know, it was a typical Denise performance, very dogged and was winning very good ball and, you know, caused a lot of problems for them and had maybe one or two little chances as well. But I think, you know, if you're looking at the game on Friday, I would have to mention Heather Payne and Megan Connolly. I thought the two of them were excellent. And yeah. I think Heather especially, I think that's honestly, that's the best game I've seen Heather play. And, you know, they always say in GAA when when they when you change your marker, it's always a good sign. And I think Ukraine changed their changed their left back three times over the whole game. So I think that's a very good that's a good sign for Heather's performance. Amber, you you guys are all in the brutal world of a results business, and so from afar we'll judge this Irish team on whether or not they make the championships. Parking that for a second, do you feel like you're improving as a group under Vera Pau? Do you feel like the Irish team are making progress under Vera Pau? Well, I think if you look at the group that we've had, I definitely don't think we've had a better opportunity to qualify. Um, obviously, taking away what might happen in the next few weeks, I think that collectively, you know, there's been there's been good players brought in, and I think players have been given debuts with Jamie Finn and Ellen Malloy most recently, and I think that's you know it's really important for the for the development of the team that you have younger players coming through, and I think for me personally, it looks like it's going to be you know it's. At this moment in time, it's going to be it's going to be difficult to see how the how the group lays out. Um, as you said, it's it's solely based on results. And for me, I'm exactly the same. Like, you know, you can play with a really good team and but not win anything. You know, and then you kind of reflect on how good the team actually was. Um, if we manage to get ourselves a playoff out of this, you know, I think it'll be absolutely fantastic. But I think with the work and the effort and the time the players have dedicated to this cause over the last number of years. You know, I think it is just something that we so richly deserve. But unfortunately, Ukraine will be saying exactly the same thing. So mm -hmm. we just have to make sure in the next few weeks that we look after ourselves and we're ready to go. Yeah, like it's a shot to nothing. And, and as you said, at least the mindset will be absolutely clear. There's no going out and a draw is good enough or this is good enough or that's good enough. It's just go out and go for it, which, you know, sometimes in sport is a nice place to be mentally, that you've no option but to go out and win, you know, and it, it kind of simplifies everything and hopefully you muster up a big performance. I mean, it's a pity there won't be crowds there to state the obvious as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, even if I think about uh, thinking back to Friday as well, I was actually quite surprised that Ukraine actually started with two whole midfielders because we had, obviously it was something that we had um, practiced and video analysis and something we had seen. But, you know, considering they were the ones that had to get something out of the game, they had to win the game. And um, when they started with um, two in front of the back four and then three and a one, you know, I was kind of thinking, you know, they're going to be happy enough just to play out the game to see how they get on and keep themselves in the game for as long as possible and then hopefully try and try and get at us. Mm. Um, so that's, again, as you said, it's something that we're going to have to look to do against the Germans. It's sometimes it's it's nearly better to be in this position, you know, we are going to be underdogs. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But you know, at the same time, I don't think that we should be putting this um, crazy amount of pressure on ourselves. Um, you know, if you're looking at it from a far and initial point of view, basing everything off the results, you would say, "Oh, Germany will have this in the bag, no problems at all." Yeah. But that's not that's not going to be the case. And look, we're going to quietly go about our business. We're going to make sure that we're well organised and that everybody's ready to go. And you know. We always bring up the, the game against the Netherlands away. I think that's a prime example. And I think the stakes at the time were a lot higher because the Netherlands had just come off the back of winning the Euros. We were away playing from 15,000 people. They were expecting, you know, from a conversation with people after the game, they were expecting to put four, five, six passes that night. And we were just so disciplined and so organised and everybody, you know, run themselves into the ground. And it's going to be the same type of performance we're going to need in a few weeks. How's life in Cologne? Not too bad. We have a cup game on Sunday, so I'm looking forward to that. You're in very good form. Any reason why? Any reason why? Well, the coach is playing me, which is a good start. <laughs> um, I think I think I had a very good pre-season. I must say, if I'm, you know, and I worked very hard, and you know, I, I came back after the Germany camp, and I had a couple of it wasn't kind of in great form, um, going into Germany camp, and then afterwards, I suppose confidence-wise, and. And then you come out of it and I suppose I just kind of had a little conversation with myself and said, look, just keep the head down. Um, still do your little bit of practice before and after training and, you know, eventually it will come good. And, you know, thankfully that week 
it turned for us when we went in and we played a friend at the weekend and had a very good game that day. And it's amazing with confidence, you know, it, it takes you, it's so quick to lose it, but it takes you so long to get it back. But, you know, thankfully after a good week, I managed to get it back and it's it's just, thankfully it's managed to keep, keep rolling for me so far. Yeah, confidence especially fickle, it seems, when you're responsible for scoring goals, you know, like the, the, that extra burden. Um, do you have a mentor of any kind? Do you talk to, pick anyone's brains when it comes to your own game? It sounds like you're, you know, resilient enough to have a conversation with yourself and, and kind of calm yourself through a mini crisis. Is that generally your approach to those kind of ups and downs? Yeah, I think, in fairness, um, I think there's a, good, there's a good few people that I would be able to kind of relay feelings with in terms of, you know, God, geez, I'm not playing well at the minute. And, you know, I have, I have a couple of very good ones here in Cologne who, you know, are, are, can be very critical of me when I need somebody to be critical to me. And then they're also the same, they're the first person, to, you know, to pat me on the back to say, well done. And for me, I think that's extremely important. And you know, as, as you said, as a striker, you always have that little bit of pressure because it's like, well, oh God, if she doesn't score, you know, are we going to win? And I suppose for me, we signed a very good, you know, a very, a very, very good striker this year, Mandy Islacker, who came from Bayern Munich. And, you know, I suppose that she's, you know, she was a big name in, in German women's football. And I think initially, you know, the pressure kind of fell on her shoulders because she's been scoring goals for so many years. that I think the expectation was for her to come in and do the same. And, for me, then there isn't the pressure, and I can just go out and enjoy the game and play it because I always know that you know, if I'm playing well and working hard, I always find that I get myself into good positions, and then it's just about putting them away. It's funny, isn't it? So often, just going out and enjoying yourself is about ninety-five percent of the battle. Do you know? I even think it's more, and I think I found that myself over the last couple of weeks. You know, just there was one, there was one training session where. I honestly, I just wanted the ground to swallow me up. I was like, I don't want to be here. I have no interest. And I just just felt really, really miserable. And then, you know, the next day, then you go in and you have a great training session. You're scoring goals in, in the small, excited games and the big game. And suddenly then you just feel like, you know, God, this is this is easy for me now. And But then I just think it's, it's you work yourself into those positions. You know, it's just a matter, it's not just a matter of, you can't just tell yourself, oh, you know, tomorrow's a tomorrow's a good day. Just you know, be positive about that. Because sometimes it's you know, the, these days can go on for a couple of weeks, and mm. then you're kind of looking at yourself being like, you know, what's wrong with me and all that. So, thankfully now I'm kind of over that little dip that I did have. And but you know, every player has, and, and they come all the time. That's the problem with them. They can, you can't um, keep them away. But for me, it's just about working hard, and as I said, keep doing my practice before and after training, and. I find then when you go into the games, the practice that you're doing always always comes out. Yes, they must be lovely moments where you've practiced something yourself, done a few extras on a Wednesday, Thursday, and then just <laughs> who knows what what quirk it is in the world, law, of nature, or whatever. It seems to happen on a Saturday for you, and and you think, wow, that's amazing. I was just doing that on the Wednesday. Yeah, absolutely, and it's it's such a basic thing as well, but. I even find that even the balls that come in, the low crosses that come in, and you come in and you have to tap them into the net, and then you might hit one and it goes over the bar, and you're like, oh, you know, God, you know, I need to get this right. And, yeah. But then you just you do something different with your run. Like that's one thing the coaches here have been telling me quite. See, I would get quite excited as soon as I get into the box and the ball's there. I'm like, oh my God, this could I'm going to score. I'm going to score. Where sometimes they're like, just wait, you know, stay yeah. cool, and then just you know, put your foot into it. Easing into the corner, no problem. And I think that's one thing, even over the last six weeks, I've really improved in is timing my runs and getting yeah. across the right players and getting into the right areas. And, you know, if you do that, as as I said to you, the ball just then drops for you in the six-yard box. And you're like, you know, what what is this crazy world? You know, why is it doing it for me today? But, um, you know, the important thing for me is when those days happen, it's all well and good, but don't forget the days that it wasn't happening and just trying to keep yourself, you know, keep yourself motivated and keep keep getting through. And, you know, mm. the thing is, and I think if you look at Friday, you know, the likes Katie McCabe, you know, a fantastic footballer and has been an absolute lady, you know, she's been a credit to herself for years in the Irish jersey and has, has scored so many penalties first before, misses one, but that doesn't reflect on her as a person or as a, you know, as a footballer. Um, and I have no doubt that Katie will go now and do something for us in four weeks that gets us over the line. And I think that's the important thing. It's not just looking at the bad moments, it's then going and how we react to them. And 
you know, myself over the last four weeks, I've managed to I've managed to get myself into the right mentality. Great. And a last word, I was in Cologne a couple of years ago, wandered around the streets, oh. beautiful and the big cathedral. I, I don't know in the midst of this very, very strange year, <laughs> I was going to say, can you get out and about and experience the city? I, I dare say you can't. Um, have you got a feel for Cologne, though, and the culture and the people? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I suppose when I experienced the carnival last year, I think after that experience where um, I don't really know if there's a if there's a way to, to describe it or to compare it to Ireland because, you know, it's just it's just the most bizarre time of year and it's something that the whole city emerges themselves in and like you said, it's an absolutely beautiful city. There's fantastic people here. I'm playing with a fantastic club that, you know, they're so dedicated to the football. And, you know, once you put on, you know, the FC Cologne, the hoodie or the jacket, and you're walking the street, people pay attention to you. They look at you. They, you know, they admire you in a way. And, you know, it's, it's for me, I suppose, the whole thing with the GAA and being proud of your community, you know, this for me now is my community and I am, you know, extremely proud to represent them. And um, I suppose in a way you can get out and about in the city. Um, the way that Germany have dealt with the coronavirus has been a little bit different to Ireland. Um, thankfully, a lot of the things are still open, but obviously you have to adhere to the to the recommendations with the hand wash and the mask. But I just think that's been, that's been we've adapted to everyday life here. So mm. it's, as you said, it's a beautiful city and it's, it's great to be here. How's the German? It's better. It's much better now. It's if you'd if you'd asked me before Christmas, I wouldn't have said it was too great. But it's it's just amazing how, you know, I do my lessons once a week and even listening to the coach and just repetitively listening to things and you adapt to it. So I think my ear would be quite good and even my reading is quite good. But my speaking probably wouldn't be as good because I just probably don't practice it enough. Mm. But um, the girls can understand me. And when I play, I would speak predominantly through German. Um, unless I'm given out about something, then I have to go back to the English then. <laughs> uh, German in a Donegal accent. I'd say that's a new one on them. Yes, it is. Now, I have to I have to slow myself down a little bit um, sometimes. But even the pronunciation of words that, that they say, like it's... This word can be quite similarly spelled, but then the pronunciation is so different. And I just, for me, it just doesn't make any sense at all. But yeah. um, I do have to slow myself down. But to be honest, more so with the English, when I start going on a rant and I start my bringing in we and while, and then suddenly they lose all, <laughs> they lose all track of me then. Uh, well, listen, thanks for making time for us. I know it's probably the disappointment of Friday still lingering, but there is Germany to come on December 1st, if people are wondering when that game is on. Uh, keep it going in the meantime. Enjoy life out there and keep up the good form. I'm Amber Barrett, thanks again. Thanks very much for having me. Football on Off The Ball with Paddy Power. New normal, same old football. Paddy Power. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie now more than ever, protecting your family, staff and customers is critical. Introducing Novaris Home and Business Air Disinfection. Made in Ireland, our range of medical grade devices are scientifically proven to kill airborne viruses. Simply plug in and protect 24-7. Novaris, you can't disinfect the air, we can. Order online now at novaris.ie. Hi, Theresa Mannion here with some important information about driving during hail showers. If you encounter hailstones on the road surface, First, reduce your speed without braking if possible. Driving slowly in a high gear will help your tyres maintain grip, even as your tyres move over the compacted pellets of ice. Always warn other drivers using your hazard warning lights. For more tips and advice, visit rsa.ie. Like every rural county, we were dying for air to come. The business really, really needed it, so we haven't looked back since. It's been brilliant. That's Lee Williams, co-owner of the Wicklow Brewery and Happy Air Business customer. Get air gigabit fibre broadband from €30 Euro a month. Call 1-800-400-555. Air. Let's make possible. Subject to availability. €30 Euro a month for the first four months. €55 Euro a month thereafter. XVAT. 24-month minimum contract period for 1 gigabit FTTP. Early cease charges may apply. Offer available for limited time. For full details and terms, see business.air.ie. At Guaranteed Irish, we believe enterprise is at the heart of thriving communities. Like me to you, the nationwide multi-store gift card accepted in over 5,000 retailers, including Brown Thomas, Henny's, Lifestyle Sports, Tesco, and exclusively in Smith's Toys, Apple Green, and Home Store and more. 
It's also the gift card of choice for many of Ireland's largest and best-known employers. So remember meetu.ie when rewarding staff this year while also supporting Irish retail. Available online or in-store at Apple Green. So look out for it. Guaranteed Irish. Altogether better. The moment you see the Volkswagen you want, from the new Tiguan SUV to the all-electric ID3, you just know. It drives the way you want it to drive. It's built the way you want it built. And it's powered the way you want it powered. Now is the time to follow your instinct. Search Volkswagen 211 today for our latest offers. Volkswagen. Football on Off The Ball. With Paddy Power. Minimal contact in stadiums? Shouldn't stop the usual suspects from going down. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie OK, so just to sum up the evening that has been Liverpool 2-0 winners at Anfield in the end against FC Michieland from Denmark. Manchester City 3-0 winners away to Marseille. Real Madrid, Borussia Mönchengladbach turned out to be a cracker in Germany. A 2-2 draw there. And Atletico Madrid have come from behind to beat Salzburg 3-2. So wins for Liverpool and City this evening in the Champions League. Elsewhere, Drogheda are first division champions domestically. A 2-0 win against Cabin Tealy. Bray drop into the second division alongside UCD. Longford and Cabin Tealy will compete in the playoffs. Tomorrow morning, OTBAM coming at you from all the usual places. Half past seven as usual. Conor McKenna of Tyrone will be on with the lads as will Brennan Deveni and Colin Cavanagh as well speaking about their experiences of Donegal Tyrone clashes in Ulster and then tomorrow night amongst other things Brian O'Driscoll with us on Wednesday Night Rugby Richie is on the way for Tom Dunn we'll talk to you tomorrow <laughs>